All right, it's the uh, top of the hour, uh, noon here on the East Coast. Uh, so I'd like to begin now, I, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar uh, from the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or the CSIAC. Uh, and today's webinar is titled Cloud Computing in the Government Sector, Understanding the Cloud Architecture and Requirements. Uh, my name is Tom McGibbon from the CSIAC. Our presenter today is Mr. Gary Hamilton, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Uh, before we begin, a few comments. Um, all the phones of all the attendees have been muted except for the presenters today. Um, however, you know, questions can be asked at any time during the pr presentation by entering them through either through the Q&A pane or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. Um, I will be monitoring questions uh, and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Um, copies of the slides will be available afterwards. Um, if you would like a copy of the slides, um, my email address is on the, is on the screen there, uh, and you can uh, send me a request. Also, uh, we are recording uh, this presentation, and so if some of your friends weren't able to attend this live, they'll be able to, to watch it. Uh, on, the re on the recording, and the video and the audio will be posted, and we will distribute a link to the, to the video once, once it is posted. Uh, now, to begin today's pres presentation, let me just give a quick uh, overview about the CSIAC, uh, or Cybersecurity and Information Systems IAC. Uh, again, please note my email address. Um, I'm Tom McGibbon for any follow-up. Uh, the CSIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions Incorporated, that's who I work for, uh, and is funded through the Department of Defense's Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, the Cybersecurity IAC is a specialized technical focal point and in information clearinghouse for information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management for DTIC. Uh, please uh, make sure to check out our website and join our community of practice at, at the top, as you see on the top of the screen, it's HTTPS www.csiac.org. Uh, also, we have two uh, LinkedIn discussion groups. Welcome you to join that. Uh, one is called the CSIAC Software Intensive Systems uh, Group, and the other one is the CSIAC Information Assurance Group. Okay, now having said that, let me introduce our presenter today, um, Mr. Gary Hamilton from Assured Information Security, or AIS, serves as a research scientist in the areas of cloud computing, virtualization te technologies, cybersecurity, and anti-forensics. His research in cloud computing includes attacker deception and containment, fight through, remote detection of malicious hypervisors, and protected computations on remote uncontrolled infrastructure. Mr. Hamilton holds a master's degree in computer science and a bachelor's degree in computer science and technical communications, both from Clarkston University. So now I'll turn this presentation over to Gary. Welcome, Gary. It's good to be here. I hope everybody's doing well today. And we're going to get moving here pretty quickly, and we're going to kick right off and try to move as quickly as possibly can. We have a lot to cover. So we're going to be looking here at four basic topics. Um, just fundamentals of cloud computing, background, some light background information, how the infrastructure uh, works, and um, how the different parties um, uh, relate to one another in that, in that infrastructure. Um, we're going to also discuss uh, the FedRAMP authorization process, and we're going to give an introduction to FedRAMP Plus, which are agency-specific uh, standards that are in addition to those specified by FedRAMP. And uh, we will uh, then provide a conclusion and identify a few of the challenges. So to begin with, uh, fundamentals of cloud computing. So what we're going to cover is um, definition of cloud computing, um, essential characteristics, the service models, deployment models, business models, and a very brief overview of some of the major providers. So this is the NIST definition of cloud computing, and it's rather, uh, it's rather wordy, but a few of the key uh, components are on-demand network access to shared computing resources. They can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management. So a more 
a more uh, conversational uh, definition is cloud computing is really nothing more than providing access to users to remote servers that host their applications and services, store data, and process that data. So there are two essential components in cloud computing. There's the provider and the consumer. The provider is the organization that offers the cloud environments, so that might be Amazon uh, Web Services. And uh, they maintain the hardware, they maintain the software, and in many cases they also retain the data and on local storage, uh, on their storage. Um, the cloud consumer is the user of those cloud environments. So how does cloud computing differ from traditional models? Well, there are five essential characteristics. Um, On-demand self-service, so the consumers themselves are responsible for provisioning resources. So you may be provided with a cloud instance, perhaps with an operating system installed, but you are responsible for deploying the applications within that environment, um, as well as for um, managing the storage and some of the processing, uh, handling the actual storage and processing. Um, there's also broad network access, so that's you know remote access to a cloud instance. Resource pooling, so that's the ability to have um, you know a single set a, a, a set of hardware and storage and processing that are used by multiple res, uh, multiple uh, consumers, and rapid elasticity, so that's adjusting those resources to meet changes changes in demand. So um, a good example is um, a web server and adjusting to an increased load on that. Um, and finally, measured service, which is the metering of that resource usage, and that's most notably used in uh, in their billing. So, next we'll cover service models. So, there are primarily three with a fourth emerging service model that uh, you will find in cloud computing. Um, so the big three are software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Um, software as a service is a model in which the provider offers everything up through and including the application. So you are you are purchasing access to an application. So an example might be um, Microsoft Office hosted in the cloud. It might be, um, say, WebEx hosted in the cloud environment. And with platform as a service, what you have is the customer, uh, the customer themselves is deploying their applications. The provider themselves hosts the, cl host the cloud instance up through the operating system. So if you look at this image down here, you'll see um, you have the hypervisor and hardware and under uh, underlying um, infrastructure of that cloud environment. You have your virtual machines, operating systems, and applications. Software as a service provides everything up through that stack. Platform as a service provides everything up through the operating system, and infrastructure as a service provides everything up through the virtual machines. In infrastructure as a service, the consumer themselves can deploy their own operating system, and um, that's a model that's particularly useful if you're doing a lot of low-level driver development and that sort of uh, and that type of work. And finally, you have emerging uh, network as a service, which uh, provides a virtual network. So in the deployment models, so the, the deployment models address where that cloud actually physically resides and what what level of control the consumer has over it. So in the private cloud, so in that private cloud, it's a resource that's owned by the organization. It may sit on their premises, it may be off their premises, but it's within their control. Um, they own, they manage, and they operate that cloud environment for use within that organization. And you'll find that um, in government, um, you'll find that uh, private cloud is the, uh, naturally the only uh, environment that's approved for secret processing and storage of information. Um, community cloud, you'll find that it's used by a collection of organizations with shared interest. It's it's owned and managed and operated by one or more of the organizations, and it's shared amongst those organizations. So it might be a, a DOD-wide cloud. Um, public cloud, so general public cloud, uh, it's Amazon Web Services. It's hosted, supported by a third-party business and, uh, and, deploy, and used by a, a remote uh, consumer. And finally, you have a hybrid cloud, which is a mixing of two or more deployment models. So you might have some of your resources hosted within a private cloud and others hosted off uh, a public cloud. And so it's a merger between those two. It's a blending. 
So now we get into what the business models are of the providers. So there are six basic types of, of providers, and we're going to briefly cover each of these and address um, what their major role is within um, the cloud. So the most essential one is the cloud service provider. Um, they are the organization that are marketing um, a cloud service uh, to consumers. And this is most notably, say, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services. These are the uh, rack space. These are the big providers that are offering services directly to consumers. Next, you have a cloud services brokerage. Cloud services brokerage is a reseller of cloud services. So they, their goal and their primary role is to support the consumer in migrating their applications, their software, and their operations into cloud environments. And they may be responsible for negotiating contracts with cloud service providers, um, addressing issues like um, you know, required uptime and, and quality of service guarantees, as well as rate negotiations. Next, you have a cloud services aggregator. So this is similar in, in some respects to a brokerage. But what they're doing is they're reselling services to uh, multiple cloud providers. So an example might be a, a cloud uh, provider um, that offers, um, say, a WebEx service, another one that offers um, you know, Salesforce, Salesforce um, um, tracking of uh, customer management. And the cloud services aggregator would provide you a single point to access those services, one or more services by different providers. Um, and they're primarily acting as a reseller. Uh, next, you have a cloud builder. So these are the organizations that are responsible for implementing and deploying clouds for the provider. So they may be uh, an organization within the provider, or they may be completely separate. And they're responsible for standing up the hardware and load balancers and the different equipment, uh, the hypervisor, and any virtualization models used, um, and as well as the, the metering of service. Next, you have a value-added uh, reseller. Now, this, this is where these last few get a little bit more obscure. So um, these are the types of organizations that offer on-premises IT projects, but with also uh, offering cloud services as well um, in support of those. Um, and uh, they may provide the services directly to a provider, but they may also go through the aggregator, through an aggregator. Next, we have a managed service provider. So they offer on-premises cloud-based network management, and um, they may offer those services directly to a provider or through a cloud service aggregator. Uh, let's see where we are now. So this is a brief overview of some of the major providers. Um, there is a more uh, detailed description of providers that cover several hundred providers and in some level of detail as to what model they satisfy and the different types of services they offer and whether or not um, their software and their infrastructure is open source or proprietary and what their licensing is and how their billing works. But this will give you a brief overview and a forthcoming uh, publication will cover these things in more detail. So um, several of the results came from the Talking Cloud 2013 survey of software as a service platform as a service and infrastructure as a service providers, along with uh, several other sources of supporting information. Um, so what we did is we went through and we identified the biggest um, providers, uh, 12 software as a service providers, 8 platform as a service, 10 infrastructure as a service, and 4 network as a service providers. So software as a service providers, um, these are your go-to meetings, um, Microsoft Office 365, that's Office in the cloud. So it provides all your email service, calendars, conferencing, all of those services in the cloud. Google Apps, Salesforce, um, McAfee, Cloud Builder Security, uh, Dropbox, all of these different types of, of application level services hosted in the cloud. So next we have Amazon Web Services and in platform as a service we have it, it's clearly led by Amazon Web Services with Microsoft Windows Azure and and several others following up. Um, the notable thing uh, here is um, 
they're providing everything up through the operating system and providing an environment for you to host uh, applications. Um, so interestingly, the Red Hat OpenShift Foundry is actually geared directly towards de uh, application development support. And so they actually have different flavors in a different provider will best, you will need to match what your requirements are to the different providers to find one that best meets your needs. Next we have infrastructure as a service. You'll see Amazon Web Services comes up again. Well that's because in that model they, it can provide you either as infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. The only difference is whether or not you have an operating system installed on that, on, on that uh, cloud instance. Um, again, you also have Windows Azure, uh, Rackspace, and some of the other big big players in this area. Network as a service is an emerging model. Um, its usage is very limited. It's it's in its infancy. Um, there are four uh, there are four well publicized providers in this area right now um, listed below, and it's currently really going through uh, uh, definition and, and, and structuring and, and we'll see in the next year or so a better definition and a better understanding of exactly what types of service they're going to provide. So now we're going to get a little bit into the FedRAMP authorization process. So um, to give you a quick overview, FedRAMP is the process that cloud providers are required to go through in order to provide services to any organization in the federal government. And they give you a set of guidelines and security settings that primarily focus on cloud instances, but also handle how that provider responds to incidents and what their policy and guidance is and who they inform in the event of an incident and what type of information they provide to the government and to the consumer when an incident occurs. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're, we're going to define uh, the, uh, the FedRAMP and we'll give a brief overview of the authorization process. Um, it will be a very brief overview. The forthcoming publication actually covers it in great detail. And we then give a summary of what the FedRAMP baseline controls are. So these are the controls um, that define security settings. Uh, for the cloud instances, and we also discuss ongoing assessment and authorization requirements. So these are requirements that providers have to periodically go through to maintain their accreditation. And finally, we identify the uh, major FedRAMP authorized providers. So the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program, FedRAMP, is responsible for standardizing all of the requirements that cloud providers are required to meet in order to provide services uh, to the federal government. Um, it's, it's the combined effort of multiple organizations. It's GSA, it's NIST. Uh, many of the NIST requirements are actually drawn on for this, um, as well as uh, DHS, DOD, NSA, OMB, and the CIO Council. So it's the governing board of FedRAMP is the Joint Accreditation Board, and you'll see this a lot um, in the actual uh, requirements where a lot of times you'll have open-ended requirements, and in the requirement be, it will be as simple as, you know, if, uh, if, let me see if I can find a good example here. So for information uh, backup, so how you perform backups, there's a series of guidelines that you're required to meet, but there, there are different processes and different ways of implementing this process, and it's very open-ended. And so the process for doing this may vary from provider to provider. And so what they do is they allow the provider to go through and provide a plan to the Joint uh, Accreditation Board. And if it's approved, then they are allowed to, then, then that is, if, if that's accepted, then they can receive accreditation based on that plan. Um, the Joint Accreditation Board may bounce it back and require certain changes to meet uh, standards. So it's very open-ended in some cases. So there are two basic sets of FedRAMP requirements. There's a baseline control set and there's ongoing assessment and authorization requirements. So uh, baseline controls are just the basic security system uh, settings for these systems. Um, it's drawn from NIST 853 control sets and it's divided in two sets, low and medium. 
So the median requirements are for uh, levels of information that require greater protection and um, low are naturally um, just general information um, that requires less uh, stringent security. And the uh, consumer themselves have a role in defining what their requirements are, whether they require a lower medium um, um, uh, security. So the information system, so a good example of this is the ex information system will ex enforce a limit of not more than three consecutive invalid login attempts by a user during 15 minutes. So the two sections in italics are fields within NIST 800-53 requirements that are specified by FedRAMP, not more than three and 15 minute period. Um, another example is the actual password requirements that you'll see. Um, they require, um, so for FedRAMP approval and FedRAMP low approval, passwords have to be case sensitive, minimum of 12 characters. Uh, you have to have a minimum of one uppercase, one lowercase, one number, one special character. Um, so the password restraints, one day minimum, 60 day maximum, you have to renew passwords minimum of every or at a maximum every 60 days, and it doesn't allow password reuse for 24 generations. So these are the types of, of requirements that are laid out by FedRAMP, and understanding these help will help you to understand exactly um, what your constraints will be operating in a cloud environment that's FedRAMP approved. So ongoing assessment and authorization. So these are requirements that specify operational visibility. So this is the type of information that's passed both to FedRAMP and to the cloud uh, cloud consumer and how change control is handled. So when you change your infrastructure, when that cloud provider makes changes to their infrastructure, they have to notify FedRAMP and the cloud consumer as well. And incident response is another example. It governs how that provider responds both to, not only to FedRAMP, the FedRAMP organization and the cloud provider, but they're also required to uh, um, notify US CERT in the event of an incident and also provide any information that's needed to remediate that and to handle those uh, and to handle uh, remediation from, from that incident. So these requirements are also based on NIST specifications, the SB 800-137 requirements. So understanding the, the baseline controls, so there are 17 categories of control, and this table here lists what those controls are. So it controls access, awareness, and training, so that specifies how often um, you know, the, the cloud provider will provide um, security awareness and, and training to their, uh, to their uh, staff. It has audit accountability, assessment authorization, uh, media protection, so how do you handle um, media within that environment? So if you, take a, uh, if you take a system offline, how do you cycle it out? How do you manage it? Um, so within these, there are 116 FedRAMP low requirements within these 17 categories. And this, this column here, the FedRAMP low requirements column, um, tells you exactly what the breakdown is for each area for those low requirements. And the FedRAMP moderate requirements, I should read moderate, not medium, there's 296 of them, and this gives you the overlay. So the total number, and then in parentheses, the number that go beyond um, the FedRAMP low requirements. And the reason why we have this number is because in some cases what you will have is a change in FedRAMP medium to a FedRAMP low requirement. So they may have the same requirement, but it's more stringent for the FedRAMP medium case. So for the baseline controls, so understanding these controls, um, and uh, I'll make a segue here. Um, so in the forthcoming pe publication, what we do is we go through and we enumerate every single FedRAMP low, every single FedRAMP medium requirement within this, and we merge all of the different 
uh, information in, into these to specify exactly what those requirements are. So what you'll find is when you're dealing with documentation from it, what they'll do is, is FedRAMP will release a document that refers to a NIST 800, um, a NIST 800 uh, baseline control document. And it's very difficult to understand and to merge those and understand exactly what changes and what the requirements are. So what we do is we went through and we did that um, for you to to help make it a lot easier to read and understand exactly what the requirements are. And this will be also the case for the FedRAMP Plus requirements. We went through and we did this for the um, DISA draft requirements. Um, so many of these controls are actually quite broadly defined. So. Um, one example is access enforcement. The information system enforces approved authorizations for logical access to the system in accordance with applicable policy. So this is what we were discussing earlier where you have some very open-ended definitions. And what that cloud, cloud provider has to do is they have to negotiate with a JAB to determine what, how they're going to implement that. And the guidance is very vague um, and it it's comes down to having documentation from FedRAMP that um, lays out exactly how that provider is going to address any given access enforcement or any of these other vague, vaguely defined controls. So FedRAMP moderate controls are a superset of FedRAMP low controls. So every single requirement in FedRAMP low is in FedRAMP moderate. Some of them are more strict though. So. Um, The information system enforces a limit of, okay, so, yeah, um, so this is an example. So AC7, so that's access control. This is an access control requirement. And, and one example of it is the information system enforces a limit of not one more than, not more than three consecutive invalid login attempts by a user during 15 minutes. So this is a good example of a very well-defined requirement so you can understand exactly um, what you're, what you're getting. In other cases, as we discuss above, where they're broadly defined, you're going to have to go to the documentation. So, ongoing assessment and, and authorization requirements. So these are 10 requirements, but they're relatively expansive. Um, they're broken into three ca categories, operational visibility, change control, and incident response. Um, operational visibility is it clearly lays out what information that provider is going to provide to federal agencies. And the change control is, is the process for notifying and documenting any changes to that provider's infrastructure, particularly when it, it impacts the processes that they've defined to FedRAMP. So if that occurs, then they have to handle, they have to adjust, and they have to work with a JAB to uh, update their policies and ensure that everything conforms. And um, so, next we have incident response. So, um, so incident incident response governs how that provider um, responds when a compromise occurs within that environment. So, um, the plan it, they have to lay out a plan. They have to submit it, and it has to be approved by FedRAMP. Now, notifications have to be made when an incident occurs to U.S. CERT to any of the effective a affected agencies. So that is the cloud consumer. That's the user of the cloud. And they have to uh, cooperate, uh, notify and also cooperate with Fed FedRAMP and the affected agencies to remediate and to um, support any compliance reviews. So this is the authorization process for uh, FedRAMP. And um, unfortunately, we don't really have the time to go through this in detail. Um, it is laid out in the forthcoming publication exactly what's required in each step. But it begins with the cloud service provider uh, and the process for submitting um, the process for submitting that initial request to FedRAMP, and it governs how FedRAMP works with that provider to um, to uh, provide authorization to receive authorization. And once that occurs, that provider is added to a list of approved providers on the FedRAMP website. And so it basically provides a shopping list to cloud consumers of approved and, and listed uh, cloud providers that FedRAMP has authorized use. For. So currently we have 
at last count, I have 11 providers that may have gone up recently. But uh, um, so there are 11 with provisional authority to operate. That's initial authority to operate, and four have received their outright authority to operate. Um, the four that have received ATO, their full ATO, um, include Amazon Web Services, um, the East West Public Cloud, and the Government Community Cloud. And interestingly enough, USDA has, of course, uh, put up their own uh, cloud environment. They're hosting their own cloud environment for use within the government, which is definitely interesting. So now we get to FedRAMP Plus. So um, FedRAMP Plus is a layer of additional requirements that agencies will put on top of FedRAMP to approve them. Um, so currently there are a lot of organizations looking at FedRAMP Plus, including the FAA, and most notably DISA um, for DOD. And um, what they're doing is they are identif uh, identifying uh, FedRAMP requirements that do not meet their standards, and they are either adjusting them or adding additional requirements on top of it. So um, what we look at here is just a brief definition of FedRAMP Plus, and then we explore in, in a fair level of depth what di the FedRAMP Plus DISA requirements are and how they uh, affect the accreditation process. And then we have observations, things where there are small errors that um, the cloud uh, consumer may need to be aware of. So as we mentioned, FedRAMP Plus provide additional requirements beyond FedRAMP. So there are several agencies currently exploring this. So DISA is, has stood themselves up and they've said, we are going to set policy for all DOD organizations. Um, in addition, you have the FAA, Department of Education, Air Force, and, and an additional layer with Air Force, Navy, Army, DOJ, and USDA. So um, we may be looking at multiple layers of FedRAMP Plus. Um, USD, USDA does offer its own cloud service. and um, uh, so it's interesting because they're looking at it from both the angle of the provider and from the angle of the consumer. And um, so in the case of DISA, they're intended to apply to every DOD organization. So DISA, this is where it gets relatively complicated. DISA outlines their uh, requirements on four criteria, and it's the type of data that you, the you, the cloud uh, consumer, are hosting in that environment. So whether or not it's public information, which is the lowest uh, uh, security risk, unclassified private, controlled unclassified information, and classified data up to secret can actually be hosted in cloud, but it's DOD cloud service providers only. So it's either a private cloud within a DOD organization or it's some um, DOD community cloud. So the second factor they look at is the risk to conf confidentiality. So given that type of data, what is the risk to confidentiality, low, moderate, or high? What, is it a limited adverse effect, serious, or severe or catastrophic? The next one is risk to integrity. So um, what happens if that data is modified or destroyed? Is it low, moderate, or high um, Is it risk? And the fourth factor is availability. And that's left open to the customer. So what is the severity if you lose access to that service? And that is, that's completely left to the customer to find. And this table down here actually lays out each of these categories. So you have your data type where you have, you know, your different types of public, unclassified, private, controlled, unclassified, classified up to secret, and then your confidentiality requirements, your integrity, integrity requirements, and then your availability requirements. Well, what does this all mean? Well, based upon this we derive a matrix. So, so here we see the type of data, the confidentiality, the integrity requirements, and then the availability. And those four factors are used to come up with six impact levels. So for impact level one, we're dealing with public data, confidentiality is not an issue, integrity is low, and availability is still left open-ended. 
um, not really an influencing factor in any of these. And then up through six, where you have classified information, where confidentiality requirements are high, integrity requirements are very high. So the draft requirements in their in their most recent version covered impact levels two through five. Um, six was reasonably left out because um, it's anticipated to be either a DOD community cloud or a private cloud. And um, when it actually comes to defining what the, what the requirements are, in addition to the impact level, you also they also vary on the type of cloud model, it, whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service. So they actually vary because the types of technologies and, and, um, and the potential risks vary based upon the type of architecture in addition to the impact level. So the requirements for every impact level and service type are drawn from six sources. So this is these are six sources of disparate information where you have different pieces of information that you have to merge. And this is something else that's also been combined in this forthcoming report, this forthcoming uh, CSIAC report. Um, all of these requirements from these different sources have been merged um, so into straightforward, easy to read tables that, that describe every single requirement. Um, so group one, so FedRAMP authorization. So this provides the baseline. So in order, so be, as the name FedRAMP Plus suggests, your first step is FedRAMP authorization. So you have to first receive FedRAMP approval. Then next you have the CNSSI 1253 controls. So these are additional layer, these are additional set of controls that are derived from that initial NIST 853 baseline control set again. Similar to FedRAMP controls, and um, impact levels one and two have a reduced sim set. The full set applies to impact levels three through six, and it's actually tailored to every impact level. Next, ongoing authorization and assessment, or ANA. So these are consistent with the FedRAMP ongoing authorization and assessment requirements. In a lot of cases, what they do is for instead of saying the provider will notify the JAB, it's the uh, provider will notify the Oh, it's the uh, the governing board for um, FedRAMP plus DISA, DAA. The ECSB DAA is the governing board for DISA. So in many cases, it's just a it's just a name change. So next you have Group Four C2 and NetOps. So this these sets of requirements dictate how that cloud service provider has to integrate with a DOD C2 network operations. Um, it increases with impact level and it covers how the government is notified of breaches, what steps are taken to remedy the breach, who gets notified, and any other special instructions that they define. Next is architectural integration. So these are DOD-specific security requirements. They go beyond the baseline security controls. And one of these is, for example, um, cloud provider must install HBSS within, uh, within a cloud instance and must not interfere with any of the tr outbound traffic going to, uh, uh, the, going to DOD organizations. Uh, next, you have policy, guidance, and operational constraints. So these are um, a basic sets of constraints that that provider must follow and they are specific and they are tailored to every impact level. So here we have a quick review of, so this table gives you an outline of the controls, the number of controls and requirements for every single um, impact level and for each model. So here it is broken down by model and within the model, so within infrastructure as a service, we have impact levels one through six. And for each of these, FedRAMP auth authorization is required and you'll see CNSSI controls. You have for impact level five, 142 specific requirements that have to be met. You also have um, ANA requirements that have to be met and these are, these are, pretty, much, these are pretty much unchanged. Uh, from impact level to impact level and across um, areas. C2 and NetOps requirements, um, you'll see a slight change as your impact level goes up, you'll see you'll have more. And 
Um, the AI requirements again increase, and PGO pretty much stay the same. Stay the same throughout. Um, the other thing you'll see is that the number of requirements change with the cloud, cloud model. So software as a service, if you look at impact level three versus infrastructure as a service, impact level three, you'll see you'll have five more requirements here that have to be met. Uh, and uh, so these uh, types of changes are to address um, specific types of application security. So FedRAMP Plus requirements are currently still in draft form and there are a variety of errors in them. So what we've done is we've gone through and we've pulled out some of these um, some of these current problems. So um, one of the problems we have is that a lot of these CNSSI 1251 controls that they've released, they actually have parameters in them that have been left undefined. Um, so it's uh, very difficult to comply when, <laughs> when uh, there's actually nothing defined. Um, in some cases, we found requirements where you have a higher impact level and yet the requirement, the CNSSI requirement or some other requirement is actually lower than for a lower impact level. So it's clearly an issue that somebody may have cut and paste uh, from one requirement to another and they forgot to update or they didn't update some information correctly. Um, so and another problem is, is some of the CNSSI 1251 requirements are actually less stringent than the FedRAMP requirements. And this is a problem because FedRAMP authorization is, is a requirement. So what you have to do is you have to go with the more stringent requirement because if, you, if you're FedRAMP approved and then you lower your requirements to comply to the letter with the FedRAMP plus DISA requirements, you'll actually violate your FedRAMP authorization. So uh, one example of this is uh, for access control item 10, requirement 10, FedRAMP actually limits uh, concurrent sessions for each system account to one session, but DISA goes back and changes that, and they say three are allowable for privilege access and two for non-privilege access. So in this case, you have to comply with FedRAMP. You would have to comply with, the, or the cloud provider would have to comply with the FedRAMP requirement. Um, so again, yes, there are numerous kind of cut and paste errors. And um, another example is um, for impact level four, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, reporting over DIBnet U is not allowed. But um, for incident response in impact level five, um, it's accepted at impact level five here. So what they do is they require, I believe, uh, DIBnet S um, secret for reporting at impact level four and five. And yet what they do is in another section, they allow for impact level five reporting on DIBnet U, um, which it doesn't make sense. So it's it's just another error, I think, a, an error in trans transcription. So again, it's, it's a case of they're still in draft form and they're still being worked through. Um, so, so again, yeah, FedRAMP is a prerequisite for disapproval. It can be assumed that FedRAMP requirements are less strict that are less strict are void. Um, you have to address, the cloud provider would have to address the most stringent requirements. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, the other thing is is that because FedRAMP Plus is still really in, in um, its kind of initial stages and it's being defined and built on, um, these changes are in, in draft form and they're going to change. So. Um, just something to be aware of. So, and one of the problems that we found in uh, in in reviewing these requirements is that most of these controls actually focus on the security within the cloud instances, not the underlying infrastructure. So that means, you know, you it's very good at setting what the security requirements are for changing your password or for the number of connections to a cloud instance and for how long uh, it can be inactive before being locked. But what it's not good at is defining processes for how you ensure the integrity of the hypervisor or in, in, in virtualized clouds, which is virtually every, uh, which is nearly every cloud implementation. Um, so there are a wide variety of attacks that a nation you could expect from a nation state level adversary and they really aren't covered. You have the types of attacks that 
can reside on the actual hardware of the systems and are very difficult to detect. So they could reside in firmware and um, they can also reside within the hypervisor and it's possible to um, use a modified hypervisor to observe the execution of code within a, a cloud instance and to modify those computations on the fly with extremely low probability of detection. And those really, those types of risks and threats are not well handled currently. Um, so, and yes, okay, yes, back to the CSIAC report. So, um, the CSI the CSIAC report that will be uh, um, that will be coming here, I believe, in the next few weeks, uh, consolidate all of these requirements, and the graphic down here just kind of explains how how these were consolidated into one table and what it means. So, um, one example, um, we found that in, in many instances the, the requirements are actually drawn from three or more documents and you'll find some initial requirement in the first document, and then there's some change in document two, and then there's yet another change in a third document, and so it's very difficult to understand exactly what the requirements are. So what we've done is we've gone through and we've consolidated that. In addition to that, we provided uh, another level of detail that really goes into depth, um, the different cloud models, and, and discusses them in, in detail. Um, what the role is of the provider and, and say, a cloud broker or a value-added uh, reseller. And um, we also discuss the FedRAMP DISA process in, in much greater detail and really go through and explain some of the things that, that due to time limitations, we had to move through fairly quickly in this presentation. So with that, I believe that is it. And I think we're on to Q&A. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, thank you very much, Gary. It was excellent. I can tell it was an excellent presentation because I've received many requests for the copies of your slides. So um, it's really, Great. really, it's, it's packed full of information on the slides. And so I appreciate your efforts here. Um, we do have a, a few questions. If anybody has other questions, feel free to ask through the Q&A. Uh, but before we do that, I, I would ask John Reed to perhaps, we, we wanted to get some feedback on you and what you all thought about this presentation. So if I can ask John to, we have three simple questions for you to get feedback on. Uh, and while that's going on, because that'll stay up for a few minutes while that's going on, I do have a few questions. Um, I'll I'll go to this um, the most recent one first because it asks a question uh, about a particular slide. If you go back to slide 35, um, yep. if you could, uh, th they were asking is slide 35 referring to CNSSI 1253 or 1251? Um, that's a good question. I think I may have propagated my own typo. Yes, 1253. Uh, I don't know what I did there. <laughs> yes, it's 1253. 1253. I, I must have transcribed it wrong, and then, yep. yep. Okay, very good, so. very good. All right, um, thank you. Now, so we have two other questions right now. Um, let's see. How can agencies attain security artifacts from cloud providers for auditing purposes? That has to be a challenge, isn't it, I would think. Excellent question. That's a great question. So. Part of the FedRAMP authorization process and also the DISA, uh, the FedRAMP plus DISA um, that we've seen is laying out the guidelines for the types of information that the cloud provider has to provide. So in addition to that, it's also possible through, uh, through negotiations with the individual provider to lay out the types of information that have to be provided. Um, so in the case of a compromise, uh, the cloud provider themselves is required to not only notify the affected agency, the, the, the cloud uh, consumer, but they're also required to notify U.S. CERT as well as FedRAMP themselves. And from there, it kicks off a kind of a review process where there's collection of information, and that cloud provider is expected to work with all of those organizations to help understand, identify what the source of the flaw was to help provide access to, to artifacts and information from those compromised environments and to help remediate it. Now, for non-compromise uh, based um, uh, incidents, it's more, it's more or less going to be dependent upon the either the cloud consumers themselves in, in some instances can get information and artifacts out of the cloud 
out of cloud environments themselves. So, um, you know, the easiest example is, is if you're running a forensics tool like NCASE, you can run those in a cloud instance, and you can gain at least some information from those systems. But the provider themselves, it's possible also through either negotiations up front when you're discussing the terms uh, in, in, in the service um, to identify what expectations are on them to, to provide information. Okay, okay. Um, let's see, this, the next one was, uh, do these requirements apply to DOD or in DISA? Or more specifically, if I deploy on Mill Cloud, am I, am I assured that the FedRAMP moderate control set have been taken care of? Uh, I'll have to look it up on Mail Cloud itself. Um, I will look that up and I'll get an answer. Okay, back and we will send it, we'll send it to, to the uh, uh, attendee. Yep, exactly, we'll, we'll look that up. But um, in, in any other case outside of that, um, if you are deploying your own in cloud environment, um, ultimately the onus will be on you to meet those um, to meet those requirements. Um, um, so uh, expect mm -hmm. to have to implement them yourselves. <laughs> okay. okay, good, good. All right, uh, the final question I have is, are entities that are undergoing FedRAMP certification still on FedRAMP, or are they undergoing FedRAMP 2.0 or FedRAMP Plus? So the way FedRAMP Plus works is it's, it's, it's view it as something completely separate from uh, FedRAMP authorization. So it's, it's its own layer entirely on top of FedRAMP authorization. So FedRAMP is nothing more than the prerequisite. It's, it's the federal government saying that if you meet these, you're qualified to uh, provide services to the federal government. And then it's an organization within that, say DISA, saying that, well, wait a minute, you can provide it to any of these organizations, but if you're DOD, you're going to meet our requirements on top of these. Okay, okay. Um, we did get one other question. Um, let's see, hold on a minute here. Is FedRAMP Plus the same, same as FedRAMP 2.0? Um, I do not believe so. Um, they, they are separate, uh, they are separate animals. Okay, okay. Um, I, I have, uh, my own question that goes back earlier in the presentation, uh, the notion of a private cloud. Um, I, I can mm -hmm. see where, for, if you have a classified environment, you, that's what you need, but what is the yep. benefit of a private cloud? Is it that you're, you're buying a, a package set of services for your organization um, as opposed to just setting up your own infrastructure? Well, it certainly can be. So in, in a lot of cases, you can um, you know, purchase the infrastructure, uh, the, the software, and all of that from a cloud provider and stand up your own private cloud and have all of that dealt with. Right. Um, I liken it to going back to the old mainframe systems. Right. Where, you know, the, the advantage, but the real advantage of having a private cloud is that you retain physical control over your data right. and information. You're not right. entrusting it to a third party. Once you entrust it to a third party, you have a whole other layer of potential, you know, insiders and different risks that come into it, and they have their own, um, they have their own interests in in reporting in 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 how it makes them look. Um, um, we had sure. I had discussions a few months ago with a major cloud provider who was insistent that they were perfectly secure and that, that there was no need for any additional layer of security and less than less than a month later it came out that there were major portions of a botnet running on their infrastructure. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're actually getting a, a set of uh, capabilities when you when when you buy their private cloud infrastructure. So um, right. it probably exactly. helps in transparency. I mean and and if you ever wanted to move out then it'd probably be uh, easier to uh, transition to a, you know, uh, a more public cloud uh, as well. Right, so. exactly. And it's possible to have, uh, of course, within your own organization, a mix of clouds. So you may have some right. services that you that you delegate to a private cloud. And if it's something that's less critical, you may push that out to a, to a public cloud. To a public cloud, right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I, I guess that's, that's all the questions. So, um, I, I would thank you very much, Gary, again, for, for an excellent presentation. Um, if you. anybody has any qu further questions, feel free to email me, uh, and I'll pass them on to Gary for you all. So um, uh, 
if that's it, I guess we'll say goodbye, and, and, and thanks again, Gary. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.